they will sometimes achieve at the cost, let's say, of elegance, at the cost of, uh, they'll, they'll muster hair up, if you will. They'll, they'll lose, this note will not have quite the sheen that it might have had, but the piece has a thrust. When they get out in public performance, there is a freshness about it and an excitement about it that makes it a very unique experience. Sometimes they get so serious that something has to be done to lighten them up a little bit. The gestures that they make are large musical gestures, certainly very well planned and well thought out, but dramatic and exciting. They have this incredible style that's all their own, that's, that comes from all four players, but it hits somewhere about 10 feet out and says Cleveland Quartet. <laughs> obviously among the very handful of top ensembles, both in terms of their performance and in terms of their recognition. I think that's also important. There are a great many marvelous young string quartets due to a few quartets of which the Cleveland is one. Quartets that showed that not only you could have a marvelous performing mechanism here, but that you could make a living at it that you could really have a quartet and find audiences. So the whole, which one came first, who knows? But the fact is that you have a new audience for chamber music that didn't exist 15 years ago, a new excitement about chamber music, a new willingness to accept chamber music. When I came to WQXR, chamber music was one of those very specialized connoisseur type words. Oh yes, chamber music, we'll put that over in this little corner here where nobody will mind and leader will put over in this little corner where nobody will mind. Well, leader is still there, pretty much. But chamber music, no longer. That's, that's in the mainstream now. in general and string quartet playing in particular is uh, almost everything to me that's my life it's, uh, for since I was a teenager I've just been uh, totally absorbed and involved and in love with uh, everything to do with it it's, uh, to me it gives fulfillment to my life it gives purpose to my life it started back to those days back to those days when I used to hear these quartets these great quartets playing I somehow saw something there that, that lit a fire in me. I decided at that point I wanted to become a musician. That was the first thing. Because string quartets somehow inspired me to, to the, the, the art of music, to the beauty of, of music. And I decided around, I was about 11 years old, and I decided that that's for me. Playing some of the very best music that has been written for any medium and this is a wonderful, challenging, and inspiring experience, especially to try to communicate this music. You can achieve sometimes so pure a sound if the balance is right and the intonation is right. If the, the sound that each one uh, uh, produces is uh, even, such a pure uh, sound 
that you almost imagine as if the uh, overtone of the chord that the quartet is producing, as if the overtones are uh, somewhere making love in the sky or something like this. the interplay of four musicians, the ability not only to explore the music and to make that kind of very interesting statement that shows there is still some invention going on. In other words, I think the kind of uh, quartet performance that you least appreciate from a top-ranking quartet is one that sounds like they're doing the uh, 75th repeat of the same program. There has to be something fresh and something unusual that takes place at each occasion. This is what this quartet does especially well. I think the real interest in chamber music came about sort of simultaneously with the Vietnam War. It goes back now 10 or 15 years when this snowballing of interest in what we do uh, sort of began. I, I have some personal theories about it. I think it has something to do with the need for sincere and personal types of experiences that uh, the college generation during those years was particularly looking for it. People say that uh, the best uh, uh, repertoire, uh, musical repertoire, is in the string quartets. Of course, I would say that it is true, but, uh, you know, when I listen to the Third Symphony of Mahler, I think this is the best music uh, that uh, one can really dream about. For me, the thing is that uh, a third uh, symphony of Mahler. There are so many people involved, and if if one of those is not really at, at his best, the symphony not always suffers as much as a quartet. If someone is playing out of tune or uh, someone is not in his best form, and I think this is the reason why many composers really attacked this string quartet medium and rendered it the kind of the top of their creativity or the, the deepest because it's really a kind of combination between the capacity of the individual and also the standard of teamwork and I don't think you can have a more beautiful combination than this. When this school was opened in 1921, George Eastman gave a 
interview with the New York Times in which he said it was just vital for the future of music in the United States that we attain a larger audience for good music of all kinds. I certainly see the public for good music growing and I see the chamber music program and the Cleveland Quartet playing a major role in that growth over the years ahead. I think the quality of the string playing in the Eastman School has been enhanced markedly in the course of the last seven or eight years. We have a wonderful string faculty, but I think that the Cleveland Quartet has played a very vital and central role in the improvement of our string performance during that period. period 1974-1975, my colleagues and I were involved in a search, on an international search, for the best string quartet we could find. The Cleveland Quartet was, and is, even more so in the meantime, uh, a first-rate ensemble, deeply committed to teaching, uh, vibrant as, and articulate as human beings, and committed to the future of music and to larger issues involving the future of music in America. It is with great pleasure that we welcome you to the listening room. It is with uh, enormous delight that I tell you that the Cleveland Quartet is back with us. One of the nice things about the Cleveland Quartet, uh, among many others, is that when we uh, did our first broadcast, they were sort of, as we were getting started with the show, they were getting started with their careers, and they hadn't made recordings, and so they came and they played for us in the studio. And I remember when they signed their contract with RCA, I'd say, uh-oh, here it goes. Once they've got records, they're never going to come and play live again. And they said, no, 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 we will. But still, with us, they are this morning, and they're going to play for us. And I'm delighted that it's a work that they have not yet put on disc, the Ravel Quartet. Meanwhile, Cleveland Quartet, Donald Wallerstein, Peter Saloff, the violinist, a welcome especially to uh, violist Atar Arad joining us for the first time, and cellist Paul Katz. Here's the Ravel. It's an incredible homogeneity that is, is very beautiful and I can see uh, um, why many composers have chosen this medium. At the same time you have the timbre, the deepness of the depth of the cello, the, 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 the darkness, the soulful quality of the viola and, and the beautiful sound of, of the violins that actually approach the sound of the human voice. There's something um, so very beautiful about this, the fact that we're all <laughs> making the sound, touching the strings with our fingers. To bring the meaning that that composer had, that meaning of the totality of a composition, seen through the eyes of four people, but somehow at many times becoming one. We have to merge. We have to become, at many times, one person doing something together. At the same time, we mustn't lose our own voice because the composer wrote this piece for four instruments. He wanted the, the personality of each instrument, of each voice to be alive at the same time. Um, being four different human beings, our response to the score is often different. This creates a difference of opinion, that we have to resolve, again, in a community, a democracy. At times, we, we have to try many different ideas to decide which one, at that particular time in our lives, is going to work the best for the four of us. I think Peter should play a little more. I think yeah. he's still more than he was. Okay, and I, I really don't hear it. And it you have a fifth or fourth, but he has a sort of a warm chord in the middle. I think that although I can hear it the but way you're doing it. Two of them together make a chord, right? It should be a balanced sound between the two of them. I know but why he's. Things, I don't feel an active moment here. If we can just keep it quiet, that's all. I, mm. I'll play louder and fuller and warmer. Mm. When you listen to the Cleveland Quartet, 
you are hearing four very individual performers who have blended their styles in a very vigorous fashion and who have, as all major ensembles must, explored every detail of interpretation. The fact that there's a great admiration for one another, I think is terribly important. We all admire each other, I think, as people and as, as musicians. And that, that element is, is so terribly important to a quartet. Um, we don't always agree on a phrase, how to make a phrase or how to play something. But uh, that creates a little bit more excitement and a little more dynamism because we have to work out. We have to, it's almost as if we're giving birth to a, a musical composition, going through pain and struggle at times. And when we get on the stage and things happen and they work and we feel that the audience has been touched and we know that struggle and that somehow that effort and the sweat and those hours have really been meaningful. In this profession, you're making commitments for ensembles and for solo artists a year, two years, sometimes three years in advance. And along with this comes the allocation of time uh, for the United States, Canada, the European tour, maybe the Far Eastern tour, other commitments. Having put together the artistic and the physical elements of the tour, you then involve yourself with getting the programs out to local sponsors, getting the publicity material out to local sponsors, which takes mutual preparation. the logistical portion of it, and we have a complete department here that does nothing but programming and travel. A little bit more difficult for a quartet because you're not only handling four individuals, there is the logistical problem of Mr. Cello, who on an airplane buys an extra seat, and who is a little bit more cumbersome than some of his fellow strings. That business with the cello in the Vienna airport, I tell you, I think the cellist and the string quartet deserve an extra 5% of the fee, you know, for <laughs> all that uh, one has to go through. It was so typical, you know, arriving there and having this woman look me straight in the eye and say, uh, first of all, that there was no reservation for the cello. Then I think she found a reservation for the cello, and so the cello could go, but then I couldn't go. She couldn't find a reservation for me. Um, and then finally we solved the whole problem. <laughs> this business of going through airport security, I think it's one of the great traumas for me of traveling in, in a foreign country because uh, if I don't know a language well enough to explain what's in this cello case, uh, and people just don't realize the delicacy of the instrument, the historic value, they don't know what they're handling. And uh, they open a case and they stick their fingers in there and they start messing around, you know, with a Stradivarius and it's really frightening. When the quartet was first formed, there was an excitement about a trip to Europe or South America or whatever it was. There still is, but in those days, I used to take out the history of Germany or something like that and read up a little bit on the places that we were going. I would be aware of some of the important uh, architectural places, our museums, to see or visit. Here I arrived in Dubrovnik, not the faintest idea about the history of the city. Here was this fantastic walled city we're walking around. I've got no idea uh, whether it was built in the 3rd century or the 13th. Uh, there just wasn't time. I feel that we don't see a lot of the, the cities that we are uh, visiting. And sometimes I wish there will be something in the tour which will give us time to 
uh, to see more. Though I'm sure that uh, Dan and Peter and Paul and maybe me too, <laughs> we would use it for, for a rehearsal. But for me, Dubrovnik was a bit uh, different. And this was one of the uh, pleasantest times in the tour because we had one day and each one could do whatever one wants. And I prefer to, you know, to lay in the beach and profit from the sun. For me, Dubrovnik is something else because I'm more a uh, seaman than a mountain man. So I was just trying to have the most I can. You know, profit from the from the sea. Because I'm going to get my shoes wet. But I need a wave. <laughs> <laughs> jet-setting age of flying from one concert to the next and when we're home we're flying from rehearsal to teaching to this and that I mean we never see each other we never can sit down in a relaxed comfortable atmosphere and discuss anything except the uh, next crisis in our lives somehow and there's these train rides in Europe I think over the years have been very valuable for the quartet we have a couple of hours to just sit and I don't know whether we talk about uh, politics or philosophy or music or whatever it is. It's just been uh, almost a time to get to know each other <laughs> once again. I suppose I'm the type of musician who likes to squeeze out as much practice time as possible. I even practice on trains sometimes. And there's actually quite a debate within the quartet about whether to rehearse right before a concert or not. It's a very kind of uh, intense time for us. The adrenaline is building up, we're getting ready for that performance. I guess I'm one of those that feels it's very important to play together whenever possible, immediately before um, the concert. I just, it's been my perception anyway, maybe it's an inaccurate one, that if we don't go out on stage, let's say at seven o'clock for an eight o'clock performance and sit down for 15 or 20 minutes, that somehow the Intuitively, we're not on the same wavelength, that we need that time playing 15, 20 minutes together to sort of, for the antenna to get out and we get tuned into each other. And then uh, somehow the beginning of the concert goes. And now it's a real problem because we are nervous. What is the order of the program? Okay, so here's the program. A minor, B plus, C minor? That's what I think. That's what I think we uh, It's great to be in Salzburg. So Edinburgh and Salzburg, of course, are the two most important festivals of Europe. It's a beautiful city, the birthplace of Mozart. And for me, it was uh, really a chance to walk around, relax a little bit, and to see this musically famous city finally for the first time. It was nice that we were playing in Heidelberg on the summer tour because the Eastman Philharmonia is the resident orchestra for the Heidelberg Festival. And David Efron, who's a marvelous conductor and on the faculty at Eastman and the orchestra were there for the summer. A lot of our students were there and of course uh, 
coming to play for our students. Everybody gets a little bit nervous, so the tension was up. But uh, we arrived at this most incredibly beautiful ruin, this uh, medieval castle in Heidelberg. It was a magnificent place. It was just a beautiful setting for a concert. But nobody could feel their fingers. It was just it was, it was too cold, too windy, and too dark. So uh, they took it inside, and, and we played there. Edinburgh is one of the places that I like most. Like London, is one of those cities that every corner might contain a secret uh, to be discovered. Remember this, uh, the two geishas? <laughs> <laughs> Remember more than two. And, and then that we were <laughs> switching. <laughs> Nobody would believe it anyway, so don't tell the story. <laughs> It is interesting, actually, as you go around the world, each country, the audience of each country has its own personality. In Japan, the most striking thing is the lack of response. We played the first piece, and it's a very kind of polite applause that just barely gets you off stage, and that's about it. And, and the second half the same way, and then when the concert ended, all of a sudden, cheers and applause and the whole thing. And it's almost, uh, I guess this is the way they react they're digesting the whole evening. Uh, in a way, one gets the feeling that the Japanese audience almost uh, is embarrassed to interrupt you if they don't want to interfere with what you're doing. When we're on tour, we often try to spend some time hearing young quartets. It's really a very enriching and broadening experience for all of us. It gives us kind of a break from our very intense performing schedule. And it gives us an opportunity to pass on things we've picked up in our years together. And it's really incredible how technically accomplished some of these young people are in Japan. A bit more sense of conversation for example, in the second movement, where, where the music goes from one voice to the other voice, is if somehow you could almost speak to each other with your instruments a little bit more. Good morning, everyone. This is today, Tuesday, the 15th day of December, and for those of you deep in the snow and frost belt this morning, eat your heart out. Those are scenes from Honolulu, Hawaii. And then live in this half hour, four of the world's most famous musicians, the Cleveland Quartet. The Cleveland Quartet, one of the great ensembles of the world, was formed in 1969. The members are Donald Weilerstein, Peter Saloff, Atar Arad, and Paul Katz, the cellist. Good morning, gentlemen. We're really pleased to have you here this morning. We're in a big rush, I know. But I must know the source of these instruments. These are the Paganini Stradivarius instruments, and they are priceless. Where are they from? Uh, well, they were owned by Paganini, these, the four of these instruments. Uh, he played them in the 1830s. They were all made about a century before, and they're presently owned by the Corcoran Gallery in Washington, D.C. that's lent them to us. It's unusual for a museum to let its priceless instruments out of its own glass cases, isn't it? They realize that these instruments uh, die if they're not played, and uh, uh, they've taken a very uh, wonderful attitude in making them available to contemporary musicians. We are now going to listen to music by the Cleveland Quartet, the final movement of the Ravel Quartet, 
very agitated music. Gentlemen. The democracy really started right at the beginning. Don Wallerstein called his old friend Peter, someone he'd known for years. He had just finished in the Peace Corps in Chile and was in Puerto Rico. And he invited Peter to come to Cleveland, where Donald was teaching at the Cleveland Institute of Music. Martha and Paul Katz, they, were, they had been married about two years at that time, were living in Toledo, at the, uh, working at the university. And Peter was to come to Cleveland and to play with the three of them. And it was determined that they would use our living room as the base for their first get-together. Now, the quartet had auditioned and interviewed others for Peter's position, but it seemed that a match was really made on that particular evening something that my wife and children I know will never forget. I knew there was a need in Cleveland for a string quartet, and I knew at that point in my career I would like to try to form one, and so I discussed it with them, and they were interested in the idea if the right kind of job could be fi found for us. So I tried to find... Uh, the money and the right kind of job in Cleveland, and Cleveland Institute was very interested. Uh, hey. Victor Babin heard us, and he thought also the quartet had a really good potential, and he gave us a job. Martha and I met uh, as students in a student chamber music group at uh, the Manhattan School of Music uh, back in the 60s, and uh, we were playing chamber music together before we uh, ever dated. I imagine that's one reason that it worked so well for us. We it wasn't as though we became, first became married and then tried to form a string quartet and learn how to work together. During the first summer when we were at Marlboro and we were forming this group, some very important musicians came to us and said, you know, the Cleveland Quartet sounds wonderful and uh, we think you have a wonderful future, et cetera, et cetera, but really don't try and form a string quartet with your wife. It'll just never work. And, uh, of course, that we didn't feel at it just wasn't the case with us. Uh, we had 11 wonderful years together in the quartet. Uh, we had traveled the world together, we made our careers, we made music together, all of that type of thing. It was a very uh, close kind of personal experience. To Martha, a home and a family and roots and all of that sort of thing is very, very important. And that's why when we did decide to have a child, we knew that at some point Martha would leave the quartet. We did a, uh, an interview from Aspen a couple of seasons back when Atar had just joined the group. We did it actually, it was with you, Peter, wasn't it? And Paul and myself. Yes, I'm you and, and Paul. And we talked, Atar, you weren't there, but we talked about you at great length. Sure. Uh, <laughs> and Happily, the, I was not there. Yeah, <laughs> and about what, what uh, sort of a person they were looking for and how thrilled they were to have found you. What sort of an experience was it for you to come in to a quartet that had been ongoing and had building had been building its own personality for so long. See, it was a good experience. Yeah, it was a good experience. <laughs> <laughs> no, Paul, uh, seriously, what, what, what was it that you were seeking in, in the new player, and, and how, how long did it take really to, to settle in to where it is now? Well, what we were looking for, uh, first of all, was a first-class instrumentalist, and we were looking for somebody that had uh, his own personality and a communicative gift. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we definitely found that um, in, in Atar. We had a chance to tour with um, Adi as a substitute to Martha even before she had made a decision to leave mm -hmm. the quartet and during that time we became uh, good friends and we knew that we would be able to get along on a personal basis. After leaving the Cleveland Institute of Music we uh, went to Buffalo. In order to go to Buffalo, this is a state university in New York at Buffalo, we had to compete with several other quartets uh, from other parts of the world uh, and we were so to speak, uh, <laughs> elected or uh, desired by the student body and the faculty there at the time.
And the major project for us there was to follow in the footsteps of the Budapest Quartet in the performance of the Beethoven, the complete Beethoven cycle. After being there for five years, we went to the Eastman School of Music. We were again invited to uh, leave our job in Buffalo. And we are very happy to be at the Eastman School of Music, a wonderful school. They're very intense. When they get in the studio, they may have played a work many times in concert, but it seems as though they're approaching it almost as if from the first time. And I guess because they feel as though they're committing it for repeated scrutiny by a record-buying public and by themselves as well. Recording with a great pianist like Emmanuel Axe, it's a great joy. Working with a guest artist gives us a type of spontaneity that we strive for in a recording session. do a great deal of rehearsing in the studio. Uh, in fact, strangers would walk in and the reaction might be, haven't they ever played this thing before or do they know each other? Because they spend such a great deal of time working on little details. Uh, and I guess for a string quartet, that really is important. I think that the pace is slow for a guest artist working with the quartet, particularly the pianist. No, he's, no, he's got, no, when I Peter don't plays on think, top, he has... I, mean, I don't think, I think this belongs to the... Yeah, so. How much control do you have we'll over balance? We'll have no balance. control over balance. You have no control over balance. You the drive, but make it just that much more spacey. A little, little bit. I just want to hear this area. It doesn't have material enough, the, the sound of the strings. If you want my opinion, I say we leave it and just play well.
Yeah, I came to Aspen first many years ago, and it's the States back, must be talking back about 25 years ago. And uh, at that time, I met Don, and I remember Aspen as being an incredibly beautiful place. Just looking up the mountains, and it was just breathtaking to see those fantastic green mountains on all sides. I just couldn't believe it. It was an unbelievable thing. There's a certain peacefulness about Aspen, how, with the, being in one with nature somehow. It's just very conducive to the musical experience, to creativity. We started coming in to Aspen, I believe, when we were in our third year as a quartet. After a number of years when we felt that this really was going to be the summer home of the quartet, we felt it very important for ourselves uh, to develop something very meaningful here in terms of a uh, advanced program or serious program of chamber music. Klaus Adam, of course, as the whole chamber music world knows, is uh, a former cellist of the Juilliard Quartet. And uh, he shared the same sort of desire that we did to do something more special in the chamber music program here. Klaus Adam founded at Aspen the Institute for Advanced Quartet Studies in order to foster the art of string quartet playing in this country today. Could you, before you play, imagine the sound that you have in your mind? Just listen to, to be sure the sound is, 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 has enough substance to it, even if you're playing soft, too transparent. Just a little bit more. I mean, just, just, I, if you just try to touch a vibrato as you were playing, and the other's playing hardly anything. Just so there's enough substance in the sound, so it's, it's, it has a human quality to it. structured parts of the seminar, but a very important part of the seminar is just sort of rubbing shoulders in a, a musical and a social way, you know, the kind of barbecue that uh, we can have where we invite all five of these young quartets over and the Cleveland Quartet's there and we sit down and sort of uh, two of us play here with three of them or something such as that, mix it up. It's a, a bit of a Marlboro-style philosophy, which of uh, of course, is where the Cleveland Quartet began anyway, but at Marlboro, they take young artists and very established artists, everybody comes and plays together in a sort of a spirit of equality. One of the most you know, exciting things for any quartet, uh, refreshing, uh, is to be able to play with guest artists, just so that we get out of ourselves and interact with other musical personalities. And uh, Aspen has given us uh, an opportunity over the last 10 years to play with uh, many of the world's greatest artists. I mean, I, it's a long, long list. I'm sure I'd leave uh, a lot of uh, very wonderful people off unintentionally. We played with uh, Pinky Zuckerman and Zach Perlman and uh, Leonard Rose and Zara Nelsova and Emmanuel Axe and Misha Dichter. And it just uh, goes on and on. And, those kinds of people come through here and it's wonderful for us and in addition to that it gives us a chance when we want to uh, to be able to perform with uh, something like the seminar program with the Chester Quartet which is a uh, wonderful young quartet that's been training with us. We did the same thing uh, the Mendelssohn Octet with the American Quartet that was also in residence here uh, a, a few years back.
Thank you. 